Good day, folks. Thanks for coming to find the one for our son here at Madison 365. I'm Matthew Brownkin, your host. You find us on YouTube, Spotify, and Stitcher, hit subscribe, and all that fun jazz, share, like, you know. So last week, I, I uh, really did, a, did a, I guess, a high-level look at uh, racism within the medical system. And within that, I talked a bit about some of the eugenics that was going on in sterilization. It, it, uh, an interesting tweet came across, or thread uh, came across my Twitter line talking about actually modern day sterilization in prisons. Historically, it was more institutionalized, uh, both in in hospitals and um, mental health institutions, right? There's a, this really covered uh, a documentary that just came out called Belly of the Beast by Erica Cohn. Uh, It explores and and really it's, it's a intense piece that covers uh, California prisons and reproductive injustice and, and basically eugenics and, and illegal sterilizations within California prisons. Uh, this investigation um, was prompted by some uh, a, a prisoner uh, speaking out about a forced uh, illegal sterilization of her own, and they, they found others were, were as well as victims. Uh, the Center for Investigation uh, found California state audit and prisons records um, show that nearly 1,400 sterilization procedures occurred between 19, 1997 and 2013. A Freedom of Information Act request and um, other states confirmed um, really only six have of other states confirmed only six have banned sterilization. So, so really we're, we're having sterilization and forced sterilization probably going across the United States is only six uh, states have banned this. So really what I'm saying is uh, what I'm going to be digging into here is, is, is really mistreatment beyond sterilizations within the criminal justice system of women and predominantly black women and other women of color. Within this, it, it looks as as there's th- this woman, the main woman that, that they're talking about within documentary, or one of them, I should say, um, Dylan, a few years of being imprisoned, uh, began experiencing symptoms like abdominal pain. Dylan asserts that she was told um, she had a an abnormal pap smear, pap smear resulting in, in needing um, a cone biopsy in order to see if there are signs of cancer. The doctor asked them, do you want any more children? Dylan responded, yes, because she's looking forward to forming um, part of a healthy relationship and raising more children because she felt that her sentence had robbed her from having that chance. And they, you know, they went on with the procedure um, and and Dylan consented to his uh, his his directomy, um, only if cancer is found. Uh, she came out and she felt something was wrong. She asked the doctors if she could still have children. And the doctor said, yes, I don't see why not. Nine months after surgery, Dylan began to feel uh, symptoms of, of, of menopause, uh, like late periods, hope palpitations, and, and weight loss. She asked for medical records and they found that she was lied to and was intentionally sterilized. After agreeing only if she had cancer and Dylan not have cancer. The kind of furthermore, the Center for Investigative Reporting, a CIR found, um, reported that between 2006 and 2010, at least 148 pregnant women received tubal uh, ligation shortly after giving birth while incarcerated at two California prisons. Majority of those women were black and, and, and Latina, and staff targeted people deemed likely to be incarcerated again according to investigations. So, and and in addition to people sterilized during labor, an unknown number of cis women and trans people were sterilized during other abdominal procedures. The Guardian reported California used state funds to pay doctors a total of almost $150,000 to sterilize women. One doctor told that news outlet, the amount paled in comparison to what you save in welfare. Now, this is a long history of eugenics and within this country of sterilizing women, particularly black women and other women of color, and particularly uh, um, Latinas and indigenous women. For all sorts of reasons and using this type of justification that is cheaper, it's better for society and, and down the line, that's before we even get into women being sterilized uh, for reasons of of a lot of times made up reasons of mental health and, and this is what we call, you know, the, the label of hysteria is part of this. And that, again, that even before we get into women that 
were sterilized because they were differently abled. This is women in prison is is a really interesting aspect of it. It's a really undercover, undercovered um, part of criminal justice reform. And when we talk about criminal justice reform, women are the fastest growing prison population, with nearly eighty percent mothers, forty four percent are black, three fourths are childbearing age between eighteen and forty four. Ninety two percent of women in California prison have been battered or abused in their lifetimes. Currently, we have 231,000 women incarcerated, 1.3 women on oh, basically, and, and sorry, <laughs> uh, much more on, on, on state, um, uh, state supervision. The Sentencing Project has, has talked a bit about the shifting nature of incarceration, particularly when it comes to women in, in, in incarceration. Uh, the, the, the women incarcerated population stands over seven times higher than it did in 1980. More than 60% of women in state prisons have had children under the age of 18. So when we really talk about breaking apart families, this is an undercover aspect of this. And we have to be careful when we think about criminality as well as, as many times we make things illegal simply for being poor. And instead of helping provide resources, we punish people for circumstances that are outside of control. And if we're removing particularly mothers or breaking apart families, those children are then more likely to end up, um, you know, being within the juvenile justice system, uh, being lower income or uh, suffering under poverty. So again, kind of repeating this cycle and then punishing them for being born into circumstances outside of their control. Again, if you're pro-life, you'd be pro you know, universal child care, pro-housing, uh, you know, down the line. But we don't, we don't do these things. We don't in, invest in it. And this builds on top of, of even uh, underappreciated and unpaid labor that particularly many women of color are taken apart in when it comes to, you know, keeping families together and raising families. Within this, the race and ethnicity in prisons in 2019, uh, the imprisonment rate for African-American women was 83 per 100,000. That was 1.7 times the rate of uh, imprisonment for white women, 48 per 100,000. Latino women were imprisoned at 1.3 times the rate of white women. The rate of imprisonment, of Af Af uh, imprisonment for African-American women has been declining since 2000, while the rate for, uh, of imprisonment for white women and Latino women has been increasing. This is really interesting in that aspect, even though black women are still um, outsized, um, you know, basically despair when it comes to being in prison, their, their rate is decreasing. But even with that said, um, the Legal uh, Advocacy Project and, yeah, Uncommon Law reported that in 2016, two-thirds or 6% of all women in prison were women of color. Black women, two to three times more likely in prison than white women, right? And black girls, 18 to 19, are four times more likely or black teenagers in that specific aspect. But racial profiling of women um, is, is particularly prevalent in, in cases that are involving uh, prostitution or the war on drugs. Uh, drug rates across races... Um, is, is pretty much equal, but we know black women and women of color are more likely to be arrested and imprisoned for drug use. Um, and, and same when it comes to prostitution. But this is, again, about women having agency over their body, trying to find ways to support. Uh, you know, we, we need to legalize sex work, but we also need to have protection for sex workers um, in a variety of different ways. And even the types of offenses, again, kind of dig into this change with women. Women in state prisons are more likely than men to be incarcerated for a drug or property offense. 26% of women in prisons have been convicted of a drug offense compared to 13% of men. 24% of incarcerated women have been convicted of a property crime compared to 16% among incarcerated men. The proportion of impris imprisoned women convicted of drug offenses has increased from 12% in 1986 to 26% in 2018. Again, this, uh, yeah, uh, again, this is, is, is going to be from the sentencing project, is, is really reporting on this. And even further, though, 15% of incarcerated youth are girls. They make up a much higher proportion of those incarcerated for the lowest level offenses. 36% of youth incarcerated for status offenses, such as truancy or curfew violations, are girls. More than half of youth incarcerated for runaway 
are girls. Overall, one third of incarcerated girls are hard are are held for status offenses or for violating for the terms of their probation. This is over punishment, over criminalization. Again, many more of these are going to be uh, women of color, particularly black women. There's some really scary aspects to this. Um, I mean, these things go deeper, and particularly when it comes to womanhood and 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 black womanhood and black motherhood, we have stand your ground laws and and castle doctrine laws that don't seem to apply to women. They don't seem to apply particularly to black women. They tell you found that women who kill their partners will spend on average 15 years behind bars, while men who kill their female partners serve much shorter sentences on average between two to six years. And at least 90% of women in prison for killing men reported having been abused by those men. Um, I, I, I didn't pull up the statistics for um, the men who killed their women partners having been abused by those women, but considering most you know, physical or most uh, uh, um, intimate partner abuse is by men on, on, onto their partner, it, I bet that number is much lower, right? So these men are being abusive towards their intimate partner. These women kill them and spend two to six years behind bars. And these women are being abused by men and many times, in an act of defense, kill their partner and spend more years behind the bars for protecting themselves. And, and this happens in states that have castle doctrine laws, that have stand your ground laws, but they're not being protected. And we also know through not just anecdotal evidence, but, but, but real evidence, and we see stories across this, uh, across the line of particularly black women that are uh, working mothers. Uh, there's one just a, a few weeks ago that left a their 10-year-old uh, babysitting their three-year-old in, in a motel to go work, and she was arrested for child neglect, and her children are ripped away from her. There's another woman who went inside for 30 minutes for a job interview to provide for her family and left her child sleeping in the car and she was arrested with her child ripped away from her. Again, this this punishment of trying to find ways to support family um, without the resources to support, you know, family. If if, if child care was cheaper, if there are ways, um, you know, an access to child care, that children, child wouldn't have been in the car if, if good jobs were readily available, well-paying jobs were readily available. Raising the minimum wage, uh, a federal jobs guarantee. Um, if 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 jobs that particularly women were more likely and, and particularly black women and women call them higher income, we're talking about service industry. We're talking about um, other frontline workers um, such as, as as nurses and 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 childcare and other ca- types of care, which are uh, which is underpaid labor. You know, we're talking about a very different society. Uh, New Jersey Public Radio took a, a look at, at really New, New Jersey on this. 49% of children in New Jersey are white, 14% are black. And New Jersey children entering child care, foster care, I should say, 30% are white, 41% are black. The research showed that there's really no difference, again, in racial drug use between African American and white families. Um, but uh, this, but even then, they found a disparity within uh, children being taken away uh, based upon on race. Uh, the Alliance uh, for Racial Equity and Child Welfare pointed out to this, that the state of Texas, where well, officials analyzed their data um, and practice in 2011, they found that poverty did not account for the racial disparities in their system. Instead, the caseworkers and judges were treating poor black parents differently than poor white parents. And if there's anything that we know in, in America, if we found these disparities in one state, we'll find them in every single state. The question is just how wide and how severe they are, but they're there. And how do we compound this locally? Well, here in Dane County, we're still investing in a new jail. And they're still looking at ways to invest in this jail instead of investing in community solutions, instead of making outside efforts to invest in, 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 in black families and in lower income families and in access um, to resources. We have, we're investing in jail. And in fact, even our juvenile detention facility, talk to anybody that's familiar with it, they will tell you that there's more resources inside the facility than there are for the youth outside. So when they leave, they're left to their own devices. 
But when they're in there, they have access to, to other resources to help them along. But we perpetuate this by, by even not having these types of resources based upon the community. This jail is part of that. Part of the advocacy for this jail was the fact that there's going to be a one-stop shop for resources for folks. But these resources, more often than that, aren't found in our community. So again, we're institutionalizing access to resources folks might need to make a living, uh, to, to just survive from mental health resources to, to job training and, and, and more and more down the line. And, and just helping people through things. We are also more likely to invest in uh, programming such as money management or parent, te- uh, you know, parent uh, classes than just providing resources to parents. But most of those pe- these people are going to be poor, right? And, and we're not providing easy access to th- these things. And, and a lot of this stuff is, is, I mean, there's wider issues at hand too, much wider issues at hand. Such as, what is it, like 35 states have no laws that expressly define um, all sex between police officers and detainees as non-consensual. And and basically just means that a person in police custody, um, an officer, can have sex with that person in police custody. No person in custody can give genuine consent free from coercion. They're in custody particularly with an armed police officer. They have the power to arrest them. You know, officers have the power to arrest them. We're, we're, we're for some reason, more likely to ple- believe a, a police officer's statement than somebody that's arrested, that's detained. So, again, they can come out and, and, and say they were raped, they were sexually assaulted. Um, but who are we going to believe as a society in this aspect of it? And I should note Wisconsin is one of these states. And all of this is compounded if you're a transgender woman in prison as well. So when we're talking about criminal justice, criminal justice reform, it's, it's more than just about our men in prison. It's, it's, it goes far deeper than that, particularly when it comes to how we're treating women in this for smaller offenses, longer sentencing, Harsher treatment when uh, abused and defending themselves against being abused. The ability for officers more likely to sexually assault those detained. Punishing women, working women, particularly black working women, for lack of access to resources and further compounding the issues that they're trying to prevent. And this is deeply unfair. And, and then, again, you're getting into forced sterilizations. I don't know how you can look at this stuff and, and justify it. And, and this is how, again, continuing how places like Jane, Dane County, you know, these are the types of things why we're perpetually investing in these jails and, and, and not developing ways to support women that need resources. We're, we're putting much, much more resources into the, this, this type of punishment and not support. We're perpetuating this stuff. This is how progressives continue to perpetuate these things. Through particularly paternalistic racism. Oh, we we just need to help. We need to, well, if they didn't do this, we need to punish. The reason goes down the line. And and you look at these folks that are supporting the jail. They jump through convoluted hoops to justify their support for it. Well-meaning white people, well-meaning progressives, and their individual biases of, of how they view Black folks, and and particularly, you know, well, black folks in general, lead to this mentality, this paternalistic type of of mentality, lead to this these types of policies that continue to be implemented because not seeing black folks as fully human, as 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 full entities able to advocate for themselves, in in, in that their experiences that um, you know we we talk about get dismissed um, or say that they're being blown out of proportion or that we're here to, or, or, you know, being told that, that white folks are here to help when often their help causes more harm than good. This is what's being combated. 
So I, I, I wanted to really bring the, you know, zero in a bit more um, on these issues and, and talk about this and, and try to elevate this conversation a bit more, which is why I was bringing it this week. Uh, I hope that folks interrogate what we're investing, investing in and how these things operate. Because what's going on in California isn't an, uh, an anomaly. These things are going on across the country. And as you zoom out, the picture becomes very clear that our entire criminal justice system is, is I mean, it's working as intended, but it's horrendous in how we treat people. It's an absolute prison state and particularly compounded with issues of race and gender and sexuality and sexual identity and gender identity and class. And it comes to a very, you know, when you, you put these pieces together, what we currently have must be abolished. It can't be reformed. These, these things were on too deep. It's, it's too far gone. It needs to be taken down. And, and we need to deeply explore how we can support people better than what we do. Um, well, that is it for this week. Thanks for coming to Finding the Warmth of Our Sun. I'm Matthew Brown, your host here at Madison 365. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and all that jazz. Um, yeah, stay safe, folks. It's, it's kind of nice outside right now. Uh, hope you're doing well and have yourselves a good week. Thanks for coming. This is 365 Media.